the condition of its particular site, the condition of its location within its bigger um, city. Uh, you know, what, what does, what does, and if you're dealing with something like a national archive, um, what does, what is the idea of the archive? How do you work with that? Um, how is, how is Prague as a city? You know, how do you understand Prague? How does that transfigure itself, if you like, into a building? And what we're looking for is a whole lot of patterns. So, for example, in the Prague Library competition, we're looking at the way the landscape is a series of tucks and folds um, along the river's edge, and you mm -hmm. find that there's even even the roadways and things respond to that. So you, you know you come um, out of the valley part of the city onto the plain um, by going up a valley, and uh, and Prague Castle is literally a promontory sort of caught between two valleys, which mm. you know historically, from a defence point of view, it was it was logical. You've only got to defend one end; the rest of it's mm. impenetrable. So we're looking for those kinds of patterns um, to weave a kind of contextual ground for the project. And the reason for doing that is uh, comes back to the proposition of our book, um, Terroir Cosmopolitan Ground, in that um, in our contemporary cosmopolitan condition, when, where we no longer share a, a cultural spatial condition, Leon Van Skyke would call it, we no longer share a common spatial intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, it's important to construct, if you like, the spatial intelligence of the project itself. Uh, so in order to do that, uh, as designers, we need to understand uh, where our spatial intelligence comes from, and that's from that politically inscribed Tasmanian landscape, I guess. Mm. And then to be able to look for triggers that might allow us to understand a little bit more about the spatial intelligence that might come out of a place like Prague. Mm -hmm. But understanding that, of course, Prague, like many cities now, is a completely... A contemporary internationalized place uh, and it's impossible to imagine that uh, that people in Prague are going to share a a common spatial intelligence I mean all of our our cultural you know if you if you and I say to each other what is our cultural condition today what is the culture that we have our cultures are now linked by all sorts of things who your Facebook friends are who you talk to on the internet, who you spoke to on Skype yesterday, um, you know, and you've got information arriving to you on a daily basis from all around the world. And so your culture is not um, something that grows out of um, your presence here in Melbourne. It's influenced by that, but it's connected to all of these other things. So culture today is about personal constellations of contacts and, uh, and preferences and so on that we set up. So... Um, so if you translate that into an architectural problem and say, okay, well, if that's, the, if that's the case and your ambition is to create culturally relevant buildings, which is definitely an ambition of Terroir's work. I mean, we want, we want to create buildings that somehow engage in broader cultural issues. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you go about that? Because you know, there's no one culture, if you like, to discover. There are just multiple constellations. So what we look at is, well, what are the constellations that that particular project throws up? And that would include things like client ambition, the particular economics of the project at that particular time, um, all the readings of landscape that we've sort of talked about and the political inscriptions of landscape, mm. the histories of places. You know, Prague is a place of um, fairly radical political histories. And then... Um, you know, what's the nature of the project? What is, a, what is an archive? What's, a, what's the um, magic moment of an archive? And we began to talk about the, the way that archives uh, really hold secrets that are as yet to be revealed. You know, they contain future histories. And in a place like Prague, where there has been a fairly rocky political history, um, sometimes those secrets might be uh, not so nice. Um, and we know that because the first thing that dictators and things do is uh, burn archives <laughs> to hide to hide those facts. So, so the magic for us in the idea of an archive is things that lay dormant or hidden in a place. And the magic moment is not the fact that they are there and held, but the moment that they get opened up and reveal some new way of seeing the world. Mm. So for us, this was a really important thing. So what we do is we, we begin to pull all those things into the same space, if you like, to create 
a contextual ground for the project. And once we establish what that ground is, that gives us a set of, um, uh, or, or a way of understanding whether what we're then proposing as a design has some currency within that contextual ground. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very particular to the project. So it's not, it's not, a, it's not, we, we're very interested in questions of place, but, but not in the sense that place has some kind of essence to be revealed through an architecture but rather that place is something that's constructed by a whole lot of things, including projects which have their own um, uh, virtual potential, if you like. You know, projects have a certain quality, and that's as relevant to us as, uh, as the qualities of the physical manifestation of the place or its histories or, and so on. Are these ways of working emergent from your education as, a, as an architect? Um, I doubt it. I mean, there's certain things that 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 you can see in your history um, through your architectural education that you know you've reacted to, resisted, or taken on board. Because you and all went, the three of you went to UTAS, yeah. We began there, yep, yeah. and then um, uh, Gerard finished his last two years at Sydney. Scott and I finished at UTAS, and then I did a masters in history at, at University of Melbourne. So we've, we started at the same place and then went slightly different ways. Um, what, was, what was very good about that early uh, education at the University of Tasmania was that there were literally six people in each year. Um, so there weren't a lot of us. We knew each other across years. I think by the time Gerard and Scott get, got there, it might have been up to about 20 in, in a single year group. So, you know, that was yeah. massive. Yeah, we were yeah. all struggling with how to deal with that number of people. But uh, it meant that, uh, you know, it was a very particular way of finding out about architecture. It meant that we were pretty limited in terms of um, the quality, what, what you might call people who had a, a very well-argued, developed position on architecture were fairly rare, actually. Mm. Um, and, you know, and occasionally, for whatever odd reason, architect Tonica would turn up in Hobart. So, you know, they would be in the studio talking to you about their work and then, you know, the next day, it well, wouldn't be the next day, it'd be six months later, someone else would turn up. But it did mean that we did get involved pretty heavily in talking about architecture with local practitioners and architects who mm. have ambitions and positions and people like Mike Viney who had really quite well considered positions on, mm. uh, on the way architecture was in landscape that would be very close to our, what I would call, classical approach. Others like Barry McNeil and Lee Woolley who are far more of that romantic, um, they would say rational, I would say romantic, uh, way of understanding how architecture responds to place and to and to landscape, floating over it, a bit. and very connected to Rick Laplastria, who worked mm. in Hobart for quite a few years. So, 